who put on their headsets, I think we'll, we'll start get going forward with the conversation. So this is going to be a relatively informal session. Um, we have here uh, a number of uh, experts on internet regulation um, and the the ways in which it can go right and go wrong. Uh, Bernadette Lewis, it looks like, is not going to be with us on the panel today. Um, uh, my name is Bill Woodcock. I'll be moderating. Uh, I'm the executive director of Packet Clearinghouse. We're an international um, uh, internet operations organization. We support the operation of internet critical infrastructure like exchange points and uh, the core of the domain name system in more than 150 countries. We have um, policy and governmental um, uh, work that we do in nearly all of those countries. So uh, I've worked with a lot of regulators on internet issues over the last 20 years. Uh, Bevel Wooding is my colleague, also at Packet Clearinghouse. He is our Caribbean regional specialist. He works with uh, countries of the Caribbean on their regulatory and uh, internet development issues. Uh, Sam Paltridge, next, uh, is with the OECD the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and leads their telecom unit. So uh, he does a lot of economic and quantitative analysis of the effects of different regulatory policies. And Jane Coffin uh, is now at the Internet Society uh, doing development strategy, but uh, until quite recently was at the NTIA in the United States and before that with USAID. So she's also dealt with internet regulatory issues both within the U.S. government and um, in uh, several countries in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, so I think what we'd like to do is, uh, so we're, we're talking today about whether regulation can improve access. And so first let's define access so that we're sort of on the same page. What we mean by access is the combination of affordable price, availability, that is, it's actually um, something that people can get in their location, wherever their location may be, and functionality. If they get it, it will have some basic level of, of working. It, it is not going to be completely useless. Um, so then the question is whether regulation can help achieve these goals. And I'm going to sit down and join the panel, and we're just going to talk about it um, based on our experiences, but we'd very much uh, like your questions and involvement. As I said, this is going to be a, a very informal hour and a half, um, and we really look forward to an interactive session in which we, we try and address questions and points that you guys may bring up and hear from each of you and your, well, maybe not each of you, but each of you who are interested and uh, uh, what your experiences have been as well. So I'm going to sit down, put on the headset, and... Uh so um, perhaps uh, just start with Jane maybe, and uh, maybe you can just chat for a couple of minutes about sort of your experiences from the different points of view that you've had and what you think can make things better and uh, you know maybe as I said entertain questions fairly interactively um, good afternoon can you hear me okay great thank you very much um, Bill I've spent some time as Bill had indicated in two different countries in Eastern Europe and par partially in this region Several of the factors that I found when working with regulators that was so critical, and this is something that I found um, interesting from a perspective of uh, coming from a very consultative environment back in the United States, was that you really need to assess your environment, and a lot of this is practical and simple, but it's, it's important to remind ourselves that we're trying to help improve the infrastructure for the country and for the people in the country. And as Bill was saying, 
bring, bring down prices, make things more affordable and available, and help bring in more functionality. So assess your environment and, con and consult. This helps facilitate stakeholder participation. And I know when we say stakeholders, what do we mean? We mean the people who are invested in either using the infrastructure, building the infrastructure, regulating that infrastructure, or providing policy guidance. Um, I think for a lot of regulators, they feel that speaking to companies or constituents in their environment might be a sign of weakness, and actually it's a sign of strength if you consult. If you continuously understand your environment, and I found that as a person in policy myself, I found myself consulting with Bill Woodcock. Um, I was, it was a very difficult issue that was put in front of me w related to an internet protocol when I was working for the U.S. government, and I needed help. And I decided that it was really important for me to find out more about the infrastructure. So I actually turned to people in the internet technical community. I know a lot more now than I used to. But I, learned, I turned to Bill and others to find out what, what that infrastructure was, that I would, that what I didn't know and what I was missing. So it's very important to assess that environment. Recently, the Internet Society has been engaged with many different countries around the world and with um, companies like Bill's to take a look at providing more Internet infrastructure in the form of Internet exchange points. Um, again, you assess your environment, you figure out how to um, bring stakeholders together, understand the technical infrastructure, and then from there continue to consult so that you're not making mistakes that harm that environment. You could really disadvantage small companies. You could disadvantage the companies that are already in the market. You also need to talk to your incumbent, of course, to figure out what's going on if you have an incumbent in that market um, in order to help facilitate that environment. Um, so I'll just throw that out, the importance of assessing the environment from both the physical, the technical, and the human. Because you're always wanting to increase both that technical infrastructure, the human capacity development in your country, which is so important. And you can do that as a regulator and a policymaker by actually consulting with um, technical experts and or other policy experts around the world. So I would stress that importance of consultation, which so many people are often afraid of potentially appearing to be weak and not knowing something about a certain topic, it's important to just know what you're, what you're trying to regulate, quite frankly. Sam, do you want to just a couple minutes and... Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, so, Bill asked me to talk about a question, um, what regulators can do to help improve access and what are some of the things maybe that they, they get wrong from time to time and um, that discourage or um, don't help access development. Um, I think since I've got three minutes, I'll use one of them to give you a one minute history of, of telecoms. So we started out with monopolies and basically the government did everything. Um, it was the regulator, it was the policy maker and it was the operator. And about 20 years ago, we figured out that we've tried this for about 100 years, and most countries have less than 1% telephone penetration. So we're not doing this very well. And one of the problems, of course, was where you get investment from. And having the government as the owner and operator and the policy maker meant that any time revenue came in from whatever source, it would be... Um, rarely go back into telecoms. It would quite often go uh, to very worthy causes. It would go to hospitals, libraries, whatever. But it often didn't go back into developing the network. So we made some changes. We split off regulation from, from governments. We split off operation um, from governments. And we said to the private sector, you can have a role here since you've got the investment that we need. And part of that was having a regulator to intervene where there was insufficient competition, and that quite often happens. We know that because we have limitations. We have limitations, for example, in Spectrum, where you can't have free market access, free market exit even, because policymakers don't like it when people lose their telephone numbers either. So often they keep inefficient operators in the market. So there's various reasons that you need to have regulators. I mean, I could talk forever on why you need to have regulators. But where we've got to in the last, uh, especially the last 10, 15 years, is we've managed to transform access in telecoms to where we have over 100% penetration in, in many countries, and if they're not there yet, they will be soon. 
And, of course, the Internet came along and in many ways um, helped develop that access further because there was more demand for that access. Um, but also um, it um, helped in many other ways. It, it helped drive demand, but it also helped regulators. It helped the sharing of information about regulation. And so one of the things we do at the OECD is share best practice. And we talk about what the issues are and how we share best practice. And I was in a session yesterday with, with the former regulator from Sri Lanka. And he said one of the problems and challenges he had in going from the United States, where he did his studies, back to being the regulator in Sri Lanka, was that he couldn't access the information he needed to regulate efficiently. And the internet has helped uh, him to do that. Now, of course, on the other side, there's many things um, that regulators can do to make that better. One of the primary ways is how to make an efficient market, how to w make it work efficiently, how to increase competition in that market because that helps drive access. Um, and on the downside, we see many bad practices and we see how that can deter uh, growth in uh, network access. Um, we see in many places the market throwing up very surprising developments. Sometimes um, I'm a little embarrassed to say that many of the leading developments are often not in the developed countries, not in the OECD countries, they're in the developing countries. Um, and I'd cite international mobile roaming as one example where often you can go across borders in Africa and not pay roaming charges the way we do in developed countries. And that's, that's a tremendous outcome of market developments. But regulators have to be careful that they don't intervene in a way that may stop such a development which has tremendous benefits for consumers and there's some things that I could talk probably at length about what they do and give you many examples but um, I, I'll come back to that. I hope there's lots of questions anyway. Bevel, do you want to give us your thoughts for a few minutes? Yeah, just a few thoughts. Um, looking at the question, can regulation help I think the answer is yes, but uh, it can also hurt access um, to the internet uh, and to critical services. Um, so just to repeat something that James said, objectives must be clear. I think it's, it's, it's simple but an important reminder for regulators to always keep in mind what are we trying to accomplish as regulators. Um, I, am, I am functioning largely in a region in the Caribbean that is coming out of a monopoly mindset and that severely impedes the kinds of progressive decision making taking place at the, regulation, at the regulatory level. Um, and so a big part of, of my function, for example, is simply explaining how things connect, how decisions that might, be, that might have been acceptable a decade or two decades ago can actually now inhibit market growth and market development. And uh, bringing that kind of information um, to regulators is an important part of the, the process of them making the correct decisions. There are a couple of, of, of important um, points that I want to, to just throw out there. One is the commercial priorities versus the social development priorities. Uh, and that continues, I think, to be a, a challenge for uh, a number of regulators, uh, particularly in, in some of the emerging markets where you have um, r the income from telecoms in particular playing such a significant part in government revenues. And that puts government in a very sometimes conflicting position where there is a priority to secure these predictable revenues and what the, the providers would do is to say, well, if we were to make the markets more open or encourage more competition, then we can't guarantee you that these revenues um, will always be there for you. And, and that presents some interesting challenges as it relates to infrastructure development, pricing for services, um, opening up of the markets to different kinds of competition and of course roll out of infrastructure to enable the technology that we all love. So I think developing a holistic understanding of the implications of regulatory decisions is one of the, the key points um, that, um, that factor into how uh, decisions are made that ultimately um, have a direct bearing on the kind of benefits that are derived from regulatory practice. Uh, the other thing is, is hard data or, or, or scientific data is very important um, to decision making. Uh, I've seen cases where 
um, decisions are made on the basis of what the providers say and not necessarily on the basis of what is actually factually true. And this is a, an important consideration, particularly when you have regulators who are dealing with severe human resource constraints. And um, that really severely compromises the ability to, um, to do the kind of research and to do the kind of due diligence that is necessary to make progressive um, regulatory decisions. So just to throw those things out there and, um, and see what kind of discussion we can generate. So are there any uh, points that any of you in the audience would like to bring up or any questions yet? Or shall I? Uh... OK. So um, I think one of the things that I use as a test is whether a regulatory environment allows a teenager, a, a student in, in uh, a high school, say, to start a business that can compete on an equal footing with the incumbent. In a lot of places, that seems like a ridiculous question, or people think, you know, that, that shouldn't be a goal. Uh, but then there are other places where there are very healthy competitive markets, like, for instance, New Zealand, where, you know, the same license is available to everybody at the same price, and it's quite affordable. And there's effectively no real barrier to somebody starting a new business as a teenager that competes on an equal footing with the incumbent that is not subject to any structural disadvantage. Um, and I think that that's a really important point. I think that regulators, the, the, the main duty of a regulator, in my opinion, is to preserve opportunities for new market entrants, right? That you can't look at a market and say, this market is already as good as it will ever need to be and all we need to do is preserve the status quo and you can't count on current participants in a market to provide all the innovation that will ever be needed for the future and so what that really means is that the frustration that your current market participants uh, uh, occasion in their customers should be allowed to drive those customers towards innovation, towards providing competitive alternatives. And, you know, I before I came to this, I ran an Internet service provider. And quite honestly, the reason I did it is because there was no incumbent service provider that provided Internet access at that time in the 1980s. And that was what I wanted. So I had to cobble it together myself. Um, you know, later I saw people who were competing against the incumbent because they didn't think the quality of the service was high enough, or they didn't think the price was low enough, or they didn't think that the services were innovative enough. And all of those things were true. And anything that prevents those people from turning that frustration into entrepreneurial energy and making the market better by providing new services is an impediment to the, the growth of the market, an impediment to the raising of the quality of people's lives. And so, honestly, I think the main goal of a regulator should just be to enable kids to go out and do something better. Um, and there are far too many regulators that think that their job is to have meetings with the incumbent and talk about what the incumbent's goals are. And that just doesn't seem very interesting to me, you know? Most regulators, I think, would be far better to <laughs> pretty much just ignore incumbents and focus on you know new market entrants and the little guys and the folks who are doing something new and interesting that hasn't been done before um, let's see um, so sorry so I wanted to throw out the idea um, for many of you and I think this is something that if you're a regulator you know inherently but if you regulate to facilitate stakeholder participation, you're only increasing your knowledge, the infrastructure development across your country, and you're, again, training yourselves. It's the human capacity development angle. It's important that your own teams, as Bevel said, are trained, and that's very difficult in small countries or countries where you have resource um, issues, even in the regulator or the policy shop. Um, I wanted to give you a, a, a snapshot of a story that I heard in Lesotho. I was in Johannesburg at a meeting that the Internet Society sponsors for peering and interconnection experts. And the regulator from Lesotho was at the meeting. 
and he told me, Jane, I had to regulate in order to facilitate infrastructure development. And I first thought, uh oh, what does he do? <laughs> you know, in order for the Internet Exchange Point to, to exist in Lesotho, the laws of his country mandated that the infrastructure surrounding the group of stakeholders that wanted to run the IXP, technical experts and other internet community experts, he needed to pass a regulation that allowed for the internet exchange point to live, to exist. So that's what I mean when I say regulate to facilitate internet infrastructure and some some people think you're trying to regulate the internet. What we were trying to do is promote positive infrastructure development through regulation where stakeholders were recognized in that country because you do, as Bill was saying about a strong incumbent in some countries, if, if that incumbent isn't happy with the idea of an internet exchange point because they don't quite trust that model yet. Um, you don't want any legal uncertainty with respect to the, the viability of that, organ, of that entity, the IXP. So in any event, that was one example where it was a positive stakeholder collaboration, but also positive regulation to facilitate that infrastructure being developed. And I think as we all know that more infrastructure you have, the more economic de development you're going to have. We've seen that absolute tie with infrastructure, internet infrastructure development and economic development. And if you're a regulator, your objective should be to help facilitate economic development and not hinder that development and innovation. And as Bill is saying, if a 15-year-old is allowed to go into the market, whether he's authorized or licensed, um, and you do have to take care with that whole process, um, are, you, are you helping facilitate that child's innovation? And he could be the next, you know, Ushaidi, which was a, a crowdsourcing platform out of Kenya. But we've seen lots of different examples, and I honestly know that many of you have different environments. You have different legal systems, you have different regulatory systems. We're not suggesting that all countries are the same, but we're just saying know your market, know your people, and know the companies in your, in your, in your space. Yeah, I think it's really important as a regulator to use a very light touch. And so there are a lot of regulators who think, well, we're going to liberalize, and so that means we're going to issue a second license, right? And then suddenly the, the hunt is on for who can pay the most for the second license. And you know that's not going to be a 15-year-old, and you know it's not going to be anybody who has any innovative ideas. It's just going to be somebody from outside the country who has a big pot of money that they've managed to put together by charging too much for something somewhere else, right? Uh, alternatively, regulators can do class licenses, right? A class license is one that applies to anyone who chooses to do something, right? So a class license that says not that there are going to be three licenses for ISPs issued and you can bid for them. It's if you want to be an ISP, you can be an ISP, but this set of regulations is going to apply to you and you need to conform to them. And that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do because it applies to everyone equally and it doesn't disadvantage any one competitor relative to any other as long as they're you know reasonable requirements um, you know that can be done poorly also so to give an example from the United States um, there's essentially a class license on access to telephone poles to put new fiber onto poles that says that if you're going to uh, touch any pole you have to uh, put up a bond and you have to rent the pole for a period of 30 years paid for up front and so that's all okay if you're a huge company but if you're just some kid who wanted to rent three poles in order to run some fiber down the block it's not helpful to have to pay for 30 years up front and it's not helpful to have to put up a multi-million dollar bond um, there are other ways of achieving those goals um, so yeah I think the, class, what, the, the really classic example of a useful class license requirement is instead of saying, well, we need an exchange point, therefore we're going to rule in law that one must exist, or we need an exchange point, therefore we're going to require that everyone peer, right? The, these can be really problematic ways of approaching it. Instead, if you have an ISP class license that says, domestic traffic shouldn't be passed across the national border. It's a nice simple way of getting to where you want to be. It means that 
all of the ISPs need a way of interconnecting with each other domestically. You're not being prescriptive on a technological level. You're just saying what effect you want, and that's perfectly reasonable. So, Bill, on that, I have a question for you. Um, but first, a little history. Um, on internet exchange points, we, we realised in the OECD probably about the middle of the 90s that these were incredibly important. Um, and we were learning about something new because we all came from the, the telecoms world and we've continued to learn ever since. Pack Clearinghouse has been great in helping us with that. Um, we did a, a, a report, one of the first reports we ever did on this, and said to all OECD countries, you should encourage the development of internet exchange points. But one of the first users of that report was actually Kenya, because um, the Kenyan IX internet exchange point that today everyone says what a tremendous success it is, and it had a really rocky, rocky um, first year where uh, the incumbent went to the regulator and complained about this, and the regulator shut down the internet exchange point. And as best I can tell, that was largely be because people didn't have the right information about the role that an internet exchange point plays and the benefits that it can bring um, to developing the internet in that economy. Now, to come back to my question, we still have one OECD country that doesn't have an internet exchange point. Um, and I don't know if there's anyone here from Mexico, but, but basically my best understanding of the Mexican internet market is that there's no internet exchange point. And I figure that that reflects a lack of uh, sufficient competition in that market. And um, I wonder how Bill's proposal, though, would either help that market develop or hinder that market because, you know, are Mexican ISPs benefiting from taking the traffic across the border and getting a better price or is it because they've got no choice in exchanging that traffic domestically? So, please. So, so yeah, Mexico is, is a kind of unique case. It is by far the largest and most economically and technologically developed country in the world to not have an exchange point. It's the only OECD member country to not have an exchange point. And the reason it doesn't is because it has a incumbent monopoly, Telmex, that is incredibly strong, that has incredibly strong uh, protectionist, um, a, a protectionist regime wrap, wrapped around it that it, it perpetuates, that prevents competitors from gaining equal access to the market. Um, so there hasn't been an exchange point started in Mexico because they've essentially successfully argued that there would be no point because uh, they would refuse to participate. And if they refuse to participate, then everybody still has to get traffic to them in Texas. Um, <laughs> so, uh, or New York, or Washington, D.C., or Los Angeles or Chicago. Um, so the the mechanism, if, let's just say hypothetically that the Mexican government issued as a condition of an ISP class license that uh, domestic traffic could not be passed across the national border. In practice, what a small competitive ISP would do is they would offer peering to Telmex. Telmex would, of course, laugh at them. They would then go to the regulator and say, we are attempting to comply with this regulatory requirement. We have offered an interconnect to Telmex. Telmex has refused it. We know that we are out of compliance with the regulation, but we are doing our best to comply. We also know that Telmex is out of compliance with the regulation and that they are doing so willfully and with an aim to squash competition. Right? And then the regulator can spring into action because they have concrete grounds. So that, that's essentially the mechanism by which you use that phrase in a regulation to encourage domestic peering. Yeah. So my follow-up question, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Australian, if you haven't picked my accent. Um, the Australian regulator about 12 years ago, um, about 12, decided that because the um, strongest incumbent wouldn't um, peer with the next three largest ISPs decided to mandate um, interconnection between them 
and force force them to to peer. Um, basically, as best I can tell, from a telecoms traditional telecoms perspective, that's the way telecoms regulators think. But what happened in the next, at least the next five or six years, was because you took the next largest three players out of the market, who would have eventually figured out that if they peered and exchanged traffic with smaller ISPs, they would have developed more alternative infrastructure. But because the regulator intervened and forced the three largest players to exchange traffic, I think Australia delayed the competition that it would otherwise have, have had, um, which came later. So, Yeah, exactly. So I think this is another instance of the the sort of simpler case that I posited of a regulator going from, you know, a single monopoly license to two licenses. So in Australia, they went from, you know, having one market dominant player and a whole bunch of sort of medium sized and small guys to, wow, now we're going to have an oligopoly of four. And so they created a static market of four participants who then were able to, you know, de facto price fix. I mean, it, that's not a a useful accusation to make in the absence of specific information. But the the net effect was that the market stagnated, right? You got four participants, none of whom had much pressure on them to innovate, all of whom were protected against competition from smaller guys. Uh, and, you know, they were able to find a what the market will bear sort of price that they all charged. Um, and, yeah, as, as Sam said, it, it put quite a crimp in Australian uh, Internet development. At the same time, you know, the, the little guys in Australia were not very strategic about what they did, and uh, they they did not work with the regulator in a sort of open give and take kind of way. It was a very combative thing, it seemed like, in some ways. And uh, if you look at the Perth Internet Exchange, they did a mandatory multilateral peering agreement, which essentially meant that the big guys were precluded from participating unless they were willing to peer equally with everyone there, right? Which is not a requirement that's reasonable and not a requirement that, that obtains in very many other places so oh. yeah so let's let's go back to the audience you, you've got plenty of people here Marco um, can we get a, a microphone can we get a microphone for Marco there gentleman with his hand up yes thank you yes and please introduce yourself yes uh, thank you uh, Marco I work for the right NCC but uh, please take this comment uh, in my role as a concerned citizen. Um, on your suggestion of um, having a law that states that domestic traffic must not pass the border, a mm, couple of comments, observations. You already noted that, that at some point you suggested like, okay, so in Mexico they, they asked for pairing and then came back like, oh yeah, we try to comply with regulation. I'm not sure whether it's smart to stare at regulation that you already know that people are going to break. They're not going to be compliant. I'm, I mean, if, if, if you introduce a law and essentially part of regulation is that it sort of is a sort of law, um, you might want to make sure that it's enforceable. Now, with that, you also have the option of people saying, oh, well, if they deny peering, you must buy their transit from them. It's that's 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 the difficult risk if you phrase it like that. Maybe as a startup business, I might be better off. It might be cheaper for me to toss my packets over the border and give it to somebody else. So 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 as far as encouraging small startups, um, it might even be better to say no. If 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 okay, if if taking the detour of 200 milliseconds makes it cheaper, maybe it is. Maybe we should encourage people to look around because if if people see that money is leaving the country, they might have a commercial incentive to actually start doing stuff locally instead of being forced. So you've made about fifteen different points there. Yeah, uh, I'll no, I'll I'll try to address a couple of them and try and get 
my fellow panelists to address a couple of them. So first of all, I would say that there is a national interest in not having domestic traffic subjected to other countries' uh, uh, packet inspection regimes, for instance. Um, that was one of the things that drove Sweden uh, in the you know, 2000 uh, era to overhaul their internet exchange point system um, uh, to keep Swedish domestic traffic out of the London internet exchange. Um, and that's a quite reasonable domestic policy and it's quite reasonable for a regulator to regulate in the public interest for purposes like that, purposes that involve privacy, for instance, of domestic traffic. Um, I think price is not the only consideration here, right? Routing traffic across the national border in order to get price down indicates that there's some really significant domestic problem that should probably be fixed. And saying that uh, you shouldn't pass a regulation that you know that there will be people who will choose not to comply with I mean, what's the purpose of regulation, then, if you only regulate the things that the regulated entities want to do? You're not, again, working in the public interest. You're working in the interest of the regulated entities. So I would say that having having such a regulation, I mean, just not to focus over much on this particular possibility, but having that regulation, two small ISPs would happily peer with each other and could happily demonstrate compliance Right, so you would quickly see which entity was non-compliant. It wouldn't be that you'd be passing a law that no one could comply with. You'd be passing a law that one entity didn't want to comply with, and that everyone else was perfectly happy to. So, no. Other thoughts on this? With respect to your point, Marco, um, I'm going to take it back to more of a, a less developed market. Because if I'm paying long-haul traffic costs to another country to exchange my traffic, which is what happens if you don't have an IXP, right, in a small country. Again, Kenya is a great example of where they came up with a, collect a better um, submarine cable model, which was competitive, because there were several cables coming in, and until they came up with a better model for competition, and uh, competition from the, the backhaul from the cable landing station as well, which is important, with that IXP being put into place, you did you cut down that long haul traffic cost for locally exchanged traffic. I think this is something that is really important because some people just have a hard time believing that if Bill and I are sitting in an internet, he's in an internet cafe in one part of Nairobi, and I'm in an internet cafe run by a different ISP in Nairobi, and we didn't have an internet exchange point, the traffic from his ISP is going up through London or Amsterdam or Berlin, wherever it might be going, back to me. That's, that's just not going to A, bring down cost, keep latency down, bring up the quality of service, and it's not going to encourage me as a local participant in that market to use the infrastructure, which is exactly what you want if you're the, the companies in that market. And if you're a regulator, that may be where we are saying don't let it go over the border, but it's a different type of border, right? So we have to specify what we mean by border. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, um, I, think, I, think I, I totally agree with you in, in terms of you must have first have an internet exchange before you can regulate pairing. And I think that's, and, and we touched on, we, we partly touched on that yesterday as well. Like you said, you need enough diversity in the infrastructure to actually reach the exchange point in order to have an exchange point that becomes a success. Once you have the exchange point there, you can look into basically what will always be the incumbent that's the last one to join. Because that sort of become, become a law of nature. I think you're looking at it as a sort of chicken and egg thing, whereas a regulator is looking at it as, I can pass a law and make this happen. Um, I, you don't have to have an exchange point in advance of regulating a requirement that people interconnect. Right? If you regulate a requirement that people interconnect, then you let them find a way. And maybe that's not an exchange point. Maybe that's a whole bunch of bilateral circuits, right? The regulator's interest shouldn't be in advancing any one technology, right? Even if that's exchange points and they're a well-understood and accepted technology, it may be that there are places where an exchange point isn't the best solution. Yeah. I mean, we don't know what they are, but well, it's possible. Okay. Point, point, my point is that I think you should take it from a broader scope and not be too specific if you, if you if you pass regulation you have to look at the full package and really look at what what 
this year is. And as we discussed yesterday, Kenya was lucky enough to have multiple landing stations and, and multiple sea cables available. Not everybody is in, in that comfortable position. And that brings on the whole, the whole new game. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, you might need some incentive to push, but uh, I wouldn't make it too specific. But that's, that's my point. And I'll leave it now to the rest of the uh, audience before we go uh, deeper into this. Thanks. Uh, so, if there's not any questions from the floor, I have another one for Bill. Um, it, let's let's take our hypothetical country. We set up the internet exchange point. We say to all the ISPs, um, you must exchange traffic either here or somewhere else, but domestically. Um, if the regulator has a different set of incentives that aren't uh, the incentives that they want a more efficient uh, market, and that might be pressure from um, one source or another to raise uh, revenue or impose constraints on how uh, competitors can interact in the market. Do you see any dangers from, from that sort of solution? This is probably a trap because Sam is much smarter than me. Um, uh, offhand, I, I mean, I'm sure that really smart people with a big economic incentive can always find some sort of loophole or something. I think keeping things really simple tends to make for fewer loopholes, right? The more specific a regulation gets, the, the easier it is for f people to find ways around it. I think there are a lot of regulators that are pressured to preserve business models for government-owned incumbents or incumbents that are still partially government-owned. There's something that came up in an earlier session today that there's often a problem in developing countries where uh, they're coming out of a government-owned incumbent situation. It's very easy for the government to extract revenue from the incumbent because they own it. They just take a profit from it. And when they switch to a competitive marketplace where there are other companies that they don't own, then suddenly they don't have an easy way of getting money out of those companies. They have to turn to income taxation, and they may not be good at actually collecting that. But that's not fundamentally the fault of the Internet or the fault of those companies, right? That's a government's responsibility to be able to raise its own revenue. And if, if they can't send out their revenue collections folks to collect their taxes, that's the government's problem, not the ISP's problem. And I, I think that that confusion, that mistake, has a hugely detrimental effect on the Internet in a lot of places, right? Because the government has this pressure to preserve a business model for an incumbent, and that means voice minutes revenue, and that means that voice over IP gets made illegal. It means that you know competitive ISPs are forced through regulation to purchase services that they don't want from an incumbent. It means that a single international gateway gets defined and licensed. There are a huge number of problems that fall out of that situation that are all avoidable. I just want to give the um, real-world example of Belize, uh, where uh, two years ago the government, actually in a move that most people were looking forward to, um, took over the incumbent operator. And let me give some just some context. At that time, and still to some degree today, Belize had one um, made voice over IP illegal. Um, so using voice over IP services was actively blocked on the network. Two, even though the regulations said that um, providers were free to interconnect, the only landing point in the country was within the compound of the incumbent. So they said, sure, anyone can interconnect, but no one can get onto our compound. Um, which was a very interesting scenario. Uh, and, and, um, and then they also uh, were responsible in large part for the regulations that were in effect. The, the incumbent was the primary architect of the regulations, not the regulator. Um, so you had this situation where the government took over and, and everyone thought, well, finally, um, Belize is going to be brought into the 21st century. And that didn't happen. And it didn't happen for the simple reason that it was one of the few predictable streams of income for the government. 
and every advisor told the government that if you trouble this, if you if you open up competition, if you do these esoteric things like create internet exchange point, GASP, um, is going to be a terrible, terrible thing for your revenue collection. And um, so what you have now is a scenario where a Belize has, I think, the, the second highest um, internet service rates in the hemisphere. Two, uh, recently the incumbent made a statement that um, but we have internet access uh, and we're doing our best to make it available to as wide a portion of the population as possible. In fact, it's cheaper than the price of a tin or can of, of Coke, the drink. Um, and what they were talking about in giving that reference was true. They did have a very low um, entry point for internet services, but that service was essentially 56K being offered to schools and to, um, to school children, of course. And then they're being told, well, now you can do all the things that your foreign counterparts are doing on the internet, which wasn't true. Uh, so these are a very real situation taking place right now where... Um, where information has to be brought to one the government to allow for the regulator's hands to be untied because the regulator can't actually do anything in that scenario because of the pressures being brought by the government in terms of overarching policy and, and I, I think when we have these discussions it's very important to understand how big a deal it is for real uh, real communities and real citizens in, in territories where um, access to the, the connection between regulatory policy internet access and real economic opportunity is not always obvious um, or not not always as obvious as it should be. I've got a question for folks on the panel which is are there instances in which you think it's appropriate for a regulator to regulate either the price or the quality of internet service? I'll give you an example um, from a country, well, I won't name the country because I have great respect for it, but um, the incumbent came in and said they would offer internet service for no cost. It was going to be free. What that did to the other nascent ISPs in the country was it absolutely would have gutted their ability to compete. So I would say you can regulate and say we want a competitive market, let's see what the market can bear, but you can't let the incumbent come in and offer service free in a market where there are entities trying to compete. That would be one point where I would say you might want to come in and regulate. I don't know exactly, I would say that you'd have to do a cost analysis at some point there and see where where the cost may come out. But I would say that if the incumbent comes in and offers service free, that's complicated. So is is the response to that to fix a price or is the response to that to prohibit cross-subsidy? To prohibit cross-subsidies, yeah. predatory pricing. Sorry. The instance that Jane's talking about is predatory pricing. It's always very hard to... to um, it's quite often easy to see, but it's hard to prove. Um, generally, it's, it's better for the regulator to, to very much focus on the inputs. So things like lease line prices or how other people can enter the market to make it more competitive. You know, Generally, it's, it's a bad thing to try and focus on um, retail pricing and if I was critical for example of the European Union's um, um, regulation of international mobile within the EU area it's they have controls over uh, retail prices as well as wholesale prices and I can well see the justification for wholesale uh, regulation because it's just turned out to be a completely inefficient market there's, there's a total market failure with with um, international mobile roaming in OECD countries. It really is. And so I can see what's driven them to do it. And I can see the, the political pressure you have to have an immediate response to the action you're taking. But if you look at the retail prices, of course, they sit just below the regulated retail level and nothing ever happens. And nothing ever will happen. Because you, you, you've got no competitive dynamics going on there. So that's, that's about what I could say on pricing. On, on quality, again, you have to be very careful. Um, Rohan Samrajeeva, who's around here somewhere, I think he's in the main session, loves to talk about the budget model uh, in some countries for communication services. And he says, what is the most important, and he used to be the regulator in, in Sri Lanka, um, what's the most important thing for, for many people in these countries is price. 
And so if you're providing a service that they otherwise wouldn't have, then maybe you can't go straight in and apply the same standards that you would in more developed countries. So there's a, there's a trade-off there. One of the things that I often think about in um, sort of the, the price performance uh, trade-off, I, I analogize to a, a ladder, and I think that uh, if if someone's just using the Internet recreationally, um, uh, that it's nice for them to have good quality. Uh, they have some amount of money that they're willing to spend on their web browsing, um, but this is not ultimately what drives the growth of the internet. Ultimately, what drives the growth of the internet and uh, the reduction in in prices and and more services and so forth is when people are able to base their business somehow on the internet as a utility, and they use the internet to make things more efficient or uh, provide a better or new service that wasn't possible before. And so, again, lowering the barrier to entry means having a very inexpensive service. And so people will say, well, we want a very inexpensive, really good service. But all that really means is that they've poorly calibrated, right? They don't know what really inexpensive means or they don't know what really good means because a really good service is always going to be a really expensive service and a really poor quality service can always be a really inexpensive one. And so seeing it as a ladder means that there are people who have very little money to spend, but if there's some low quality service that they can buy that will enable them to build a new business, that will enable them in turn to make more money, which enables them to buy a higher quality service and so on, work their way up the ladder, that enables a lot of business development and economic development, whereas if as a regulator, you come along and say, well, we're not going to allow anybody to provide service below this level of quality. It means you're also putting a floor on the price. Uh, you know, effectively, nobody's going to be able to provide service at that quality below some price. And that means, in turn, that no one who can't afford that price is going to be able to use the Internet either to educate themselves or to start some new business. So I see a big danger in, in regulating quality and regulating price because you wind up with these these floors that are not low enough in in my my experience um any other yeah uh troy hi uh, uh troy edling uh, from the states um i just have a sort of a beginner's question um when you when you were thinking about uh various potential policy approaches um for uh, in, uh, increasing the speed by which traffic tra uh, travels intra one country, are, are there any assumptions or that that are being made by uh, about the character of content or about content itself? Are you are you are you saying what well, you know? We we want people to you know be communicating directly or like if you're if if for their content someone is in any case going to have to ping a server outside of the country, then uh, is is the IXP then providing actually that much of a safe saving in costs or, or speed, um, uh, in, in, or, are there sort of uh, content assumption driven po policy approaches that are being made? I, I mean, it seems like the discussion so far has just been treating it hasn't really discussed about the character of content and whether or not that makes a difference. One of the really important things about content that uh, people are, are often very oblivious to is that there are certain kinds of content in which users exercise no choice and there are other kinds of content in which users exercise a huge degree of choice and so when you see people choosing to have a hotmail email account or a google email account that's an end user exercising a choice to use a particular service in the face of other competitive services right so if this is a Mozambican customer, in theory anyway, as long as there's, you know, a market that's open to new market entrants in Mozambique for providing free email services, uh, they have the choice of using, you know, a huge U.S. company that has no local content provision or a little local company that is going to provide service and customer support in Portuguese and can send a guy running down the street to you know help you configure your your web browser or whatever um and 
so the consumer is making a choice there, and one choice benefits the local economy, and one choice, the other choice benefits the economy of a completely different country and represents an export of capital. Um, so I think that in the absence of an internet exchange point, the cheapest place to host content is next to the exchange point that people are actually using overseas. And that's really expensive, right? Because hosting content domestically would mean sending the query out to the exchange point overseas and then back in, and the response back out and then back in, right? So you've got sort of 4x unit of cost there to deliver the content. If you put the content next to the exchange, you've got a 2x unit of cost because you send the query out overseas and the response is right there at the exchange point. It comes back over that international link. Um, and the alternative, if you have an exchange point, is to encourage domestic content hosting, domestic content production, and uh, the formation of a co-location market, right? So hosting services adjacent to the local exchange. And at that point, you've got a whole new sector of your economy going um, that works really well, generates lots of revenue in developed countries, but a lot of developing countries don't really have a, a co-location and hosting market yet because they haven't reached that level of maturity in their internet market. So, yeah. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, and the example, and again, this is going back a bit in history, um, with what used to happen in New Zealand, where uh, Telecom New Zealand, the main incumbent, wasn't very receptive to peering with other New Zealand ISPs, one of which was um, Radio New Zealand that does the broadcasting for the rugby games. And if you know anything about New Zealand, you know that they're, they're rugby fanatics there. And so, and this goes back to our discussion about whether you should take traffic internationally. Um, what the, some of the New Zealand ISPs would do was go across to the US and then back to New Zealand. And if you peered with Radio New Zealand, you could get the direct coverage straight away. But the traffic they sent to the US, they kind of could control the speed of that traffic. And but so... <laughs> but but it would, it, you know, telecom, it penalised their own customers because they weren't exchanging that traffic locally. It meant that you were getting... Um, the match, the report of the match, w however much delayed than other people, you know, your neighbour across the road that had a different ISP. So, that well, and Radio New Zealand, because they had to pay to move all that traffic to California, they chose to do so at a lower quality using a, a worse codec. So anybody who was on <laughs> Telecom New Zealand got this really horrible rendition of the the game compared to people who were on ISPs that were peering with it. There, in the sort of the early days of uh, hardball peering negotiation in these uh, national markets, there were a lot of people who, who did some very <laughs> aggressive tricks in order to uh, make their, their case for, for direct peering, and that, that was one of the better ones. It didn't get quite as, quite as rough. Sir? Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, uh, my name is Radis Kritladze. I'm from National uh, Georgian Communications Commission. I'm, I represent uh, regulatory authority. So, I have still question regarding uh, IXP and namely the remedy what you proposed uh, that domestic uh, traffic should stay uh, inside country and it may make uh, operators to uh, set up uh, internet exchange point. Uh, in Georgia, we don't have internet exchange point. So uh, I don't understand, uh, to be honest, how will it work? Because situation is the following. Uh, we have two big operators. One of them is incumbent. I, they don't want IXP uh, because uh, it will promote small operators to grow up and it, it, and it will increase uh, competition. So if we say to our market that, you know, 
all domestic traffic should stay inside the country. What will happen? Uh, another 30 small ISPs uh, will have a responsibility to interconnect with ad each other. They don't have infrastructure. They should go to those big operators, incumbent and another one, and ask, you know, now we have access to all 30 other operators. And I think that uh, these big operators will be quite happy because these uh, small operators should pay for transit, they should hire lines, and uh, this remedy may kill some of them. And I don't understand clearly how can this remedy make uh, big operators and all operators make uh, to set up IXP. So the little operators then have the choice, right? The little operators have the choice of purchasing transit sorry, and, sorry. and not worry. So I, I think your question, to simplify it as much as I can, is um, if, if you require everyone to interconnect domestically, but you don't specify how, why won't everyone just go buy transit from the two big operators and the two big operators are happy with that and uh, no exchange point gets formed? That if someone wants to buy transit from a, a transit provider in order to meet that requirement, then that's fine. It meets the requirement for them and the transit provider and they're both happy. But if they don't want to purchase transit, that that's essentially my point here, is that you shouldn't force one of your new market entrants to be a customer of one of their competitors even though they don't want to be right and that's what that's what they're the incumbents are trying to do is the incumbents are trying to create a situation in which everyone is forced to be their customer whether or not they want to be and it's a very common situation in countries that don't yet have a very competitive marketplace so what you want is a situation where one of the little guys can refuse to purchase transit and say instead, we're offering peering to the incumbent. And the incumbent may say no, but then it's very clear that the incumbent is willfully violating the term of their license, whereas the little guy is not violating it through their own action. They're not violating it on purpose. They're, they're trying to comply. Again, it may not work perfectly everywhere, but this is one, one way it can be done. Yeah, sir. Dmitry. Yeah. Uh, hello, Dmitry Kachmanyuk, uh, Hostmaster Ukraine. I just want to add that uh, speaking on uh, exchanges uh, in Ukraine, the big UAX exchange was mostly supported by small operators who love to interconnect between themselves. They also have motivated the large operators to stay in the exchange. Another thing that have happened since last year, we had a decline of traffic due to technical issue of the exchange. It was not able to go with the traffic. That led to the competition between another exchange called Detail. So actually, this other exchange was competing with the original, and that at the end, the first was upgraded, and now they're competing again. So I'm saying the competition between exchanges is also healthy. Number three is that now, for example, Google is trying to get into the exchange. So existence of exchange is one of the motivating factors for the big contract delivery providers to come to the country because it lowers their cost, which is they have to interconnect with every big operators. And Ukraine is about 10 million maybe active internet users. It's not that large, actually. Actually, uh, Bevel, you've, I think, got an example of an uh, exchange point in the Caribbean that was just getting started where they were going to require licenses uh, for participation, which would have precluded a lot of a lot of that. Can you talk a little bit about the... Actually, there were a couple of examples. Um, the... The minister, in the government, a government minister responsible for telecom in one case, um, understood how internet exchange points worked. He was very intrigued by the prospect of one, not having domestic traffic routed excellently, and two, the fact that it would actually result in um, tangible economic savings for an exchange being kept in country. And um, he initiated a process through the regulator um, for the operators to establish an internet exchange point and they resisted um, quite strongly and the the regulator had to I'm, I, I was part of the the process to facilitate the discussions and one of the operators actually told me say we prefer 
not to deal with this between ourselves as ISPs, but we prefer that the regulator comes in and, and deal with it. Um, and so they actually wanted regulatory intervention in the process um, because they felt that would have been the fairest um, process to um, establish the exchange point. And in, in that case, the, the regulator had to adjust the, the Act, to, the Telecom Act, to do what Bill said earlier, mandate that local traffic remains local. Not that they establish an exchange point, but that local traffic remain local. Um, and once that act was updated, the fight stopped and they proceeded toward um, getting things in place. Uh, it took a year to get that, that act updated though. It took four months to get the exchange point um, off the ground. Is that the example you well, wanted? Well, um, the, the, what was the one we were just looking at today? Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's still in progress. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, sorry. So um, we were actually just looking at this this draft policy document for the exchange point in Barbados that was very much regulatorily driven, and it, right. it's yeah. about it's about five pages, whereas most exchange point policy documents would be like half a page, and <laughs> a lot well, of let, boilerplate. Let, let me put it this way: it it was regulatory facilitated; it was service yeah. provider driven. Okay. And the, the incumbent um, basically approached the exercise in that case as if it were an interconnect agreement in the traditional telecom um, model. And so the reason it got to so many pages was they wanted to, to cover the base on, on all of the things that you would normally cover the bases on for an interconnect for voice services. And um, again, because the regulator was not aware of the distinction between interconnecting for the purpose of traffic exchange and interconnecting for the purpose of traditional voice, um, they allowed the process to get to the point where um, the document basically, if it were to be adopted, would ensure the non-success of that exchange point. And so, but we're still at, at a point where it can be debated. But what happened in that case, and I've seen that also in a couple of the other countries in the region where they the incumbent has a history of defining regulatory policy on behalf of the regulator. Um, and so they have a lot of, of, of latitude as it relates to um, setting things in their interest, setting things in place in their interest. And the, the, the big way to, to counteract that is for the regulator to have their ears open and their, their minds inclined toward um, practices in successful better practices in other jurisdictions that uh, allow them to see beyond the advice that is coming from one source, the incumbent um, dominant provider. The reason Dimitri's comment made me think of this is because, Dimitri, uh, for those of you don't, who don't know, the Ukraine is a, a huge success story in terms of internet economy. Um, they've uh, been growing very, very, at a very fast rate for quite a few years now. Um, and so this this path of, of development that their exchange points have been on is is a very good, very reasonable one. Um, it may look like there's sort of s struggle and conflict and so forth, but that's a competitive market at work. Um, but what he was saying is that now they've got content providers like Google who want to bring content to them from other places. And the policy document that uh, Barbados has currently would prohibit that because because Google is not a licensed telecom services provider in the country of Barbados, right? And never will be because shouldn't have to be, shouldn't have to be right? And we see, we see the same mistake happening in other exchange points. It's, it's not a hugely common one, but um, there are other countries where to participate in the exchange point, you have to be a licensed provider in that country. And so Hong Kong was like that for a while, and then they got rid of that, and it helped a lot. Um, I don't know. It's an, sort of another example where light touch is hugely beneficial, right? Not having an extra rule just because you can. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and uh, in the meantime, Jane has something to... Uh, this, hang, hang. this point that I'm going to make is more of a... Um, an access point separate and apart, but it would facilitate internet exchange point um, robustness, I think. There is um, the concept for many landlocked countries of trying to get the cross-border connectivity that you need. This is a key access issue. So I'm going to throw out a term of 
there is a, or a phrase, collective strength and collaboration. If you're two countries that are neighbors and actually can work with each other to try and facilitate that cross-border connectivity, this is extremely important. We recently had an example where Zimbabwe and South Africa were trying to <laughs> bring a cable across a river. The bridge that the cable had to go over was an historical bridge. So the historical society was involved, the border society was involved, the, the customs officials were involved, the border patrol was involved, the regulators were involved, the ministries were involved. I would urge you, if you have the ability and you, you want to facilitate cross-border connectivity, there's some very practical collaborative steps you can take and, and perhaps as companies you can go in and educate the regulator and the ministry about the time to market and the fact that if you're a company trying to do business and build your network, it's very expensive to sit on the border and not have your fiber going literally from me to Dimitri or me to the back of the room. We were talking about a very short distance that the fiber had to, had to travel and be interconnected. So there are many countries where you could facilitate better access into those landlocked countries or just between and among the countries. Uh, East Africa is an example where there's a collaborative regulatory process going on right now among the regulators. Um, this is where you, they're coming up with creative ideas for connectivity and that's where we can look at good practices from a regulatory perspective to increase the access, bring down the prices, and have a redundant network in and out because if you only have one line in and it's a little tricky, complicated, it's also nice to have that second redundant line. But again, you're facilitating connectivity, you're building your national infrastructure, and you're helping your neighbors if you have that ability to help your neighbor out. Yeah, we've just been finishing up a paper on the Paraguayan market. Paraguay is a landlocked country in South America. and They border Argentina and Brazil, and so they have fiber across the border to Argentina and fiber across the border to Brazil, and you'd think that might be enough to get a competitive marketplace going, but it turns out not because uh, the complete regulatory failure here. They allowed the two largest providers inside Paraguay, one each, to become a... Uh, ex ex well, they now have an exclusive duopsony, right? So there are only two customers in the country that can be customers of that fiber, and those two customers then in turn price-fixed the wholesale rates between themselves and now there's a new bottleneck that didn't exist before. And so, of course, prices have just stayed exactly where they are. Things don't get better, so forth. So, yeah. Okay. The case with Barbados was very interesting uh, for me, and I have a couple of questions regarding it. So, uh, regulatory authority uh, established uh, Internet Exchange Point, and question is, qu they're it's in, in process. Yeah, it's uh, in, in process, okay. And the uh, owner of this internet exchange point will be regulator, it will be part of regulator, or you made uh, association of... Uh, That's part uh, of what is being ISPs discussed right now. It, uh, so uh, this is first, first yeah. my first question. The second question uh, about financing this uh, uh, internet exchange point so who financed it? Who uh, operators or regulatory body or some international organization or, or, or who? Uh, and uh, regarding uh, who, who, who should switch to this uh, internet exchange point? Just big operators uh, or all operators or what is obligations? All right. First question in terms of uh, who owns it, that's part of what is being debated right now and, and how does it function. They're looking at uh, an associ association model, an MOU between participants. Um, part of what was wrong with the document Bill referred to is that in the way it was written it made it difficult for others to come into um, participating in the exchange. But the idea is and the intention is that uh, it will be available or accessible to operators and content providers and anyone who has an autonomous system network. Uh, so that's the idea from an, an ownership standpoint, governed by the participants of the exchange. In terms of the cost, part of the process in guiding them toward an internet exchange point involved um, giving examples of the different models for building out an exchange. And um, 
one of the agreements in that process was that this would be built out on a cost-neutral basis. Um, participants have decided amongst themselves, the initial participants, that any equipment brought into the exchange uh, will be given to the exchange. Uh, government is playing its part. Uh, it sees its role as facilitating national development. And so the, the parties all agreed to um, the exchange being hosted at a cost-neutral government facility. I think they're looking at a, 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 an office space that was set up for, um, what was it, uh, export development, uh, one, a recent building, proper connectivity, good, out, um, properly outfitted. And the agreement between the parties was that they trust that government facility more than they trust each other's facilities. And so again, the issue of trust being a part of the establishment of the exchange was um, one of the hot um, topics or points of debate inside of the process. So the understanding is that we're going to keep our costs down and we're going to do that by ensuring that we find a, a, a gracious host who will cover the cost of electricity and cooling and, um, and space. And, um, and that's how they're proceeding with it. So each party will bear the cost of connectivity to the exchange. Uh, the last point was... Uh, no, one more. Uh, okay, uh, so obligation to income, for example, incumbent Who's obligated to participate. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, again, in principle, uh, in the Barbados case, in principle, uh, the discussion went along the lines of everyone should um, should be able to participate in the future. The initial participants are all of the local internet service providers. Uh, who have their own transit. That's the initial participant. But the, the intention is that the, the exchange point will be a welcoming place for foreign content providers as well as local content providers who invest in um, their own networks as well. And that's the idea. The document that's written wouldn't quite get them there, but it's still early enough in the process that that can be adjusted. I think we've got a question from the gentleman in the back row. Hello. My, my name is Sande. I'm from Tanzania. I want to go back to. I want to go back to 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 the to the, to the issue of the of the content. You see, most most of these developing countries, they are developing, they they are creating a network, a proper designed network. But the, that network that, that network at the moment is working fine. But the problem is there is no original local content that reside in the network do you have any any suggestion or you know, any any mechanism you can advise the the regulator and the government so as so as to enhance local content production in those countries well so one obvious thing is if you have um, if you have local television national television uh, radio newspapers, right? All of these things should be available locally. Um, so national television might be broadcasting rugby or it might be broadcasting whatever. Um, uh, that's locally produced content. It's local jobs. It's, you know, content that is going to be of most interest to people in your locality. Uh, all of those are desirable properties. Other thing is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, it's one of the big bandwidth users, and it's interestingly um, uh, something where user preference doesn't really enter into the question, right? So if someone starts downloading a file from a peer-to-peer -peer system, their client will try several different sources and will choose whichever one gives the best performance. So if they're able to reach a seed for that content through a local internet exchange point, that will always be preferred as long as there's enough bandwidth to it. And so peer-to-peer -peer file, sh file sharing is actually one of the things that hugely advantages locations that have their own exchange points and sufficient bandwidth to them. So um, you might want to be careful about, as a regulator, to uh, not preclude peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and uh, local content um, curation, let's say. I would actually urge you to um, hold a public consultation. I know this is uh, one of those, um, it can be difficult to do, 
and not give up if you've done it once, but try it a couple times with stakeholders that you wouldn't potentially normally reach out to. Also, um, any of us, I mean, the Internet Society, the OECD and UNESCO recently did a study on local content and the importance of local content for economic development. There's a direct relationship between the growth of local content, the infrastructure development to host that content, to let the content travel over the network, obviously, and economic development. You do start to have this cycle of once the network, sorry, when the network is developed and your users have more confidence in the network, there will be local business started because they'll have more faith in the quality of service and the, the, the infrastructure itself. So we've seen this. If you have consultations and, and don't give up, <laughs> keep having them, you can start to spur some of the local business community. And this is where a regulator can broaden its base of constituents and reach out into, as Bill was saying, if there are young people in your country who are trying to develop their own companies or their own content, there's a fellow in uh, Nigeria right now who is the, the king of Nollywood. I don't know if you know what Nollywood is. It's um, local uh, novellas in the Spanish word or soap operas. Uh, I guess exciting family drama might be another term for it. Um, it's become extraordinarily popular. This fellow just received a $2 million uh, joint, uh, venture, uh, joint venture grant to help facilitate his infrastructure. He's broadcasting within Africa. This is content that's produced locally, consumed within the continent, and it's driving up a, the desire for the bandwidth, the, the increase, uh, increased connectivity within the countries themselves and infrastructure um, quality of service, if you will. But people are using the infrastructure in a way that they wouldn't have before. So you're going to find there are some creative solutions as a regulator that I would suggest. You're ha you have whole different models now that are coming at you. Um, but it could be an interesting public consultation. You might have to do a little refereeing with the constituents, but give it a try because that may be um, a creative way to deal with that. <clears throat> um, just very quickly, because James said most of what I would say, um, don't underestimate, as Bill said, very popular content, whether that be the local cricket, the local football, whatever it is that's very popular, um, movies, I don't know, in whatever country you're in. But the, the, the key other part, I think, is, is public sector information. Yes. So get government information, whether it be agriculture, health, whatever, um, because it's that local information that, that people really want. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's exactly where I was going with it, and that's what we've been uh, advising governments largely. There's a natural relationship between the regulator and the, the government, and government in most of these countries actually is the largest holder of local content already available content and there's some very interesting possibilities as it relates to bringing that content onto exchanges and onto the local networks um, one example that we like to use is is digitizing government archives uh, again maybe not the most exciting content but it creates some very interesting connections between the internet um, multimedia education and um, content development and, and it's very easy to take um, photo archives, video archives that already exist in government information service departments and convert those to the web and make that process of conversion not a public sector exercise but actually a wonderful collaboration between public sector and civil society or public sector and educational institutions. Um, that really creates some wonderful opportunities for sparking interest in developing content beyond that initial um, repository amongst the young people who are the ones who you also want to develop certain skill sets in as it relates to local content development. So it's, um, it's a very easy uh, way to get into immediate content onto the local networks using existing material from government archives. The digital content of the Library of Alexandria in Egypt is uh, by far the single largest uh, bandwidth source in Africa uh, at, I think, 300 megabits, uh, uh, two STM1s less time I looked. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of great content um, and some of it's produced locally, some of it is just a local cache, whatever, it doesn't really matter as long as people can get at it. Um, we've got about three minutes left. I don't think any of us have any prepared closing remarks or anything, so we can take one more question if, uh, if there is one. Anybody have one more thing you'd like us to address? All right. Well, in that case, um, thank you all very, very much. I think uh, 
we all remain available to you to answer any questions you may have later, and uh, hope you have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you.